Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good to have you with us. Glad you came out today. Glad to have people with us on Facebook. Would you give them a little hand if they're with us today? Yeah. All right. I, I want to just jump right into the prayer list and, uh, and just, I, I'm ready to start worshiping. Amen. Any, anybody with me? Just ready to start worshiping. Uh, please continue to pray for the Burt McCall family. Dan Allison, be lifting him up. Continue to pray for EO and uh, the, the pneumonia he's been dealing with. Uh, Paul Vaughn, uh, Kathy Morgan, please continue to pray for Is Kathy here today? There she Oh, she's behind Jeremy. I couldn't see you. Uh, continue to pray for her. Uh, Woody and Joyce Price, uh, that's Melissa Stepp's parents. Please be lifting them up. Patricia Price, that's Karen Bradley's mom. Uh, she's battling cancer. Please be praying for her. Uh, Brenda Rumpel, please be praying for her. She's in a, a local nursing home uh, struggling. Be lifting her up. Uh, Kathy Ballard, that's Michael Atkinson's sister uh, with cancer. There's, there's so much sickness around, isn't there? Uh, just, just be praying for them. Uh, I was talking to Kenny and Angie Roberts in the first service. Their son and daughter-in-law are expecting but they're having some complications. Please be praying for them and the baby. Uh, Diane Merrill's mom, she had uh, COVID, was in the hospital. She's out now, but be praying for her, if you would, please. Selena Lauder, continue to pray for her. Uh, Tim Medlin, who's uh, waiting on a kidney transplant. Danny Greer, who is waiting on a heart transplant. Uh, please continue to pray for Vicki Patterson who's recuperating from back surgery and is going to have another surgery in about a month on her ankle. So please be praying for Vicki, if you would, please. Uh, we did Irvin Ball's funeral this past Thursday. Please continue to pray for them. And this afternoon at 2, we're doing Jean Hoots' funeral here at the church. Uh, pray for Donnie and his family. Donnie, we love you, brother. And uh, we're here with you, okay? All right. How about an unspoken request today? I have many myself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for putting enough health in our bodies and desire in our hearts to come out to be with you today, Lord Father, to be with one another. And Lord, I pray that you just bless us today, Lord Father. I pray that you'd bless the music, the worship. Lord Father, let us just worship you freely today, Lord. And Father, I pray for the message. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me, Father, because I cannot do this without you. Lord, Father, we pray for anyone and everyone who is sick, suffering from some kind of affliction, Lord, Father. We pray, Lord, Father, for those that serve us, those that help us in our community and in our cities, Lord, Father. We pray for them. Lord, Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones in recent days and weeks. And, Father, we pray specifically for Donnie today, Lord, Father, that you would just be with him in this valley that he's walking through, Lord, Father, and help us to love him and show compassion toward him, Lord, Father. Lord, I pray that you'd give him a peace and comfort that is beyond his comprehension. Lord, Father, we pray for our community. We pray for our church. We pray for our nation. We pray for the world, Lord, Father. But, Lord, we pray most of all for the lost, for those who do not know you, Lord, in a real and personal way. Lord, I pray that if someone here or someone watching via the Internet, if they've never given their heart to Christ, please let today be that day. We love you, Father, and we thank you again for letting us be here. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Anybody bring a voice with them today? Amen. Anybody? Oh, I've got one yep. <laughs> Any other yeps out there? Yeah. All right, all right. Let's, let's worship. Darkness 
drive roll over my bone sorrow comes to steal joy out and brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love my
But last week I was watching these guys. Now, see, I'm a preacher's kid. I'm used to being in the glass fishbowl. Everybody around me. That's what's wrong with her. Okay. Okay. You know, and people going, ooh, did you see what she has on? Ooh, does her daddy know that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My baby back here. So I'm used to it. And so standing up here singing, you know, I've been singing my whole life, so I'm used to that too. But I look at these boys. Look, you got daddy, son, nephew. Dad, daddy's cool with it. Daddy's done this before. Son and nephew. It takes a lot of confidence Amen. to get up here and do this. Yes, it does. A lot. Yeah. Because, let me tell you, these guys have grown so much. I see them growing and reaching and grasping for God. And that's the point. That is the point of all of this. Amen. Is to grow and reach and grasp for God. I see Seth entering adulthood, fixing to get married. Oh. How awesome. How awesome is that? I see Blake driving his own little truck up in the parking lot. <laughs> I held him when he was born. Okay? And t well, there's Tim. But my we hair, love My hair is nicer than both of them. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he does have better hair. He does have better hair. But it does take a lot of confidence for these guys to stand up here and do this and, and put, your, put your heart and your soul out there and just hope and pray that God does a work through you. So... I just want to acknowledge these guys and Brian and Jimmy and Donna and Michaela. I just want to acknowledge all these guys and say, you know, y'all are amazing. Y'all are confident. There's that word again. So now we're going to tell you why we're confident.
I appreciate James. But, you know, when the Lord lays songs on my heart, I told him, I said, I really didn't know that I was picking all the songs out for you to sing this Sunday, but <laughs> today's James Day, so he does a great job. <laughs> yep. One, two, three, four. I don't know about y'all, but I, I could do that again. <laughs> I really could. I might, uh, Donna, I might stop preaching five minutes early just to get y'all back up here. <laughs> I, I know it. <laughs> James, get a drink of water, son. You ain't over. Oh, man. Well, anybody glad to be in church today? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I was talking to some folks this morning who've been visiting your church, and uh, they said, this is the friendliest bunch of people. I said, yeah, they all right. <laughs> They're okay. Oh, uh, goodness. Let's go to the book of Luke this morning. Luke 
chapter 24, verse 13. You can go, Brian, we've been there for three weeks. Might be for three more. We'll, we'll see, okay? When God says stop preaching it, I'll move on. Amen? A little background. Just in case this is your first Sunday here, if you had not caught us on Facebook, we're, this is the passage where Luke talks about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's the first Easter. Jesus is risen from the tomb. But his disciples and followers are feeling lost and forsaken. They've went to the tomb and they can't find the body of Jesus. Even though Jesus told them that he was going to rise, they can't find him, so they're distraught. Some of them are leaving town. Let's look at two of them. And behold, two of them, two of his followers, disciples, went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. How far is that, church? About seven miles southwest of Jerusalem. And they walked together and talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together, as they walked together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Please say amen right there. Amen. Please don't make me do this by myself today. Because I will amen for you all morning. It's always good when we're walking along and Jesus joins us. Okay? There you go. Verse 16. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Supernaturally, God did something to their vision or to Jesus' appearance that they didn't know who they were walking with. Even though they had been walking with him for about three years. Verse 17. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Why are you walking down this old dirt road so sad and down? Now remember, Jesus doesn't ask us questions for information. Sometimes he's fishing. All right? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. Q. That's another place to say Amen. Jesus is alive, okay? Verse 24, And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. All right, I want us to go back just a few verses. Go back to verse 21, okay? This is going to be our focus verse this morning. Cleopas said, But we, his disciples... But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Have you ever received something from someone and was just completely blown away because it was way better, way more than you expected. Has that ever happened to you? That happened to me one Christmas many, many years ago. My mom was still alive, and we went up to mom and dad's for Christmas and, you know, to share with them. And, and uh, Tammy and I hadn't been married too long. And uh, dad hands me an envelope. It says, Merry Christmas. 
I thought, well, that's, that's really cool. He gave me a gift card. Maybe there's some cash in it. That's wonderful. I opened it up, and inside this envelope was the deed for the property on which Tammy and I live now. Yeah, while we, wow, blew us away beyond our expectations. Maybe you've asked somebody to do something, and maybe you hired them to do a task, and they went well above and beyond what you expected. Has that ever happened to anybody? Let me, let me, for, for all you people that, that only get sports, let me give you a sports analogy. Have you ever watched a really short person dunk a basketball? <laughs> I have. Who, who, who was, used to play for state? Spud Webb? Spud Webb, five foot seven, five foot six, something like that. Dunk a basketball. That's not what I expected. That is beyond, and you know, sometimes, here's the key, sometimes we underestimate people, don't we? Come on, church. Sometimes we underestimate people. That's exactly what is about to happen to these two people on the road to Emmaus. They have underestimated Jesus. See, they wanted Jesus to rescue them politically and do it quickly. But Jesus is going to rescue them spiritually, eternally. He is going above and beyond their expectations. They have underestimated Jesus. Write this down. Our felt need is not always our greatest need. That, that's a good one. I didn't make that up. That came from God. Okay, so I'm going to say it again. Our felt need is not always our greatest need. Okay? I've talked to people over the years who's going, who they're going through a hard time. Perhaps it's a financial crisis or something like that. And they've sat in the pastor's study and said to me, You know, Pastor, what I really need to do, what I really need is to win the lottery. That's their felt need. What they really need to do is learn how to manage what God has already blessed them with. Their greatest need. You see the difference? We have felt needs and then we have our real needs, our greatest needs. These two disciples thought they needed a king of Israel. But what they really needed was a savior, the king of kings. Amen? Am I making sense this morning, church? They wanted Jesus to save them from Roman oppression, their felt need, but he's going to save them from their sins, their greatest need. They've underestimated Jesus. Church, here's my question to you this morning. Is it possible? Do you think perhaps maybe it could be that we underestimate God? Do we? Do we underestimate God? I believe we do. In fact, I've prayed about this for the last few weeks. Okay? And I asked God, God, show me where I underestimate you. Just open my eyes, open my heart, and show me where I, I underestimate what you can do in my life. And praise God for yellow sticky notes. Amen? I got to have them. So I got a yellow sticky note on my desk in my study and I started writing these things down just as the Holy Spirit gave them to me. I'm going to give them to you today and next week. Okay, I'm not going to unload all this on you this morning. All right, I'm going to give you a few this week and a few next week. Okay, A few areas in which we underestimate God. They're in no particular order. This is just the way the Holy Spirit gave them to me. Amen? Number one, we underestimate God's passion. I think we underestimate how much God loves us. Do you agree with that? You know, a couple of Wednesdays ago, a couple of Wednesday evenings ago, uh, we started having our Wednesday night church meeting again, and it, it, it's fantastic. The place was practically full. It was great. And uh, we just went around. We talked to everybody. And told him to tell us something good, and we were just praising God. And I asked Bo Caldwell, I said, Bo, would, would you come up and just close us in prayer? He said, yeah, I'd be glad to, Pastor. He said, can I say a word? I said, absolutely. And uh, Bo came up, and he, he gave us a little devotion before he closed us in prayer. 
And he asked us to think about John 3.16. John 3.16. John 3.16. Everybody, everybody, you know it? Have you heard it before? Oh, you're in for a treat if you haven't. You're going, yeah, pastor, everybody knows John 3.16. For God so, say it. Thanks, Brian. You gave it away. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> For God so loved the world. And I know that there's people here going, well, that's cool, Pastor. God loves the whole world. Yeah, I get it. He does. He loves the whole world. But listen, Pastor, I'm just a face in the crowd. I'm just a dot in this mass of humanity that God loves. But then Bo continued. He said, take out the words the world and put your name in I did that for God so loves Brian Melvin that he gave his only begotten son. that changes things folks that changes things that makes it <laughs> it makes it personal I, li I like that I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that God loves the world. I'm glad God loves y'all. But I'm really glad God loves me. Are, are, you, are you with me? It makes it personal. L listen, church. God is a personal God. He is an intimate God. He created you. He cares about you. He knows you so well. He knows the thoughts that you have before you have them. He knows when you're born. He knows when you're going to go into eternity. He knows the date, the hour, the time. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows Greg better than Brenda knows Greg. The Bible says he knows you so well. He knows how many hairs are on your head. I didn't know that he was going to fix it so he didn't need a calculator to count mine. <laughs> but that's how well he knows us and cares about us. Here's, church, here's why I think we underestimate the passion, the love that God has for us. Somehow, we have bought into this notion, into this idea that we, say we, we. that we determine if and how much God loves us by the way we behave. Let that sink in a minute. I think we've decided, well, the way I behave, the way I live my life, that's going to determine how much and if God loves me. If I'm, if I'm good, God loves me. If I'm not so good, when I mess up, well, then God doesn't love me as much. Folks, you know what they call that? That's a lie. That's a lie from Satan himself. Listen, folks, there's an old saying. You can't do anything more to make God love you more. And you can't do anything to make God love you less. He is love. Anybody in here ever messed up? Anybody in here ever sinned? Anybody ever hurt somebody? Ever sinned against God? Done something so despicable? So bad, it makes you feel dirty inside. Don't raise your hand. It's between you and God. I'll raise it for you because I know most of us have. Things that we are ashamed of. God still loves us. More than we will ever be able to fathom. Even when we get to heaven, we won't be able to fathom the love, the passion that God has for us. When we start saying, well, God loves me if I'm good, but he doesn't love me as much as if I'm bad, so I'm going to try to be good. That's us trying to control God, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to try to be a real good person so God will love me more. We talked about this some weeks ago. We have a word for that too. It's called legalism. Legalism. Trying to perform our way into God's love and favor. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear the right clothes. I'm going to say the right things. I'm not going to do this, and I am going to do that. And all that. No, that, that's, that's legalism. That's us trying to control God, trying to purchase His love. 
Folks, it's wrong. Let, let, let me tell you something. Let me free somebody up this morning, okay? Our behavior does affect how much God will bless us. It does. Some of God's blessings are conditional upon our obedience to Him. But, everybody say but. But God loves you and I unconditionally. Unconditionally. Never underestimate the passion that God has for you. Again, I know there's somebody here this morning. Maybe there's several people. And you're thinking, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things I've said, the things I've thought, the things I've, I've done. You, you, you have no idea how bad it is. I don't. But you know what? It don't matter. The only person interested in that is Satan. And you shouldn't worry about his opinion anyway. Jesus Christ loves you today more than you will ever, ever know. Number two, the second word God had me write down. We underestimate God's plans. We underestimate God's plans. These disciples on the road to Emmaus, they thought Jesus would save them from Rome. That's what their expectation was, okay? But listen, God had bigger plans. Amen? He had bigger plans. Church, listen to this. God has bigger plans for you than you can imagine. He does. Bigger plans than you can imagine. And I know somebody's here going, well, I don't know about that preacher because I got some big plans. I got some stuff I want to do. I got some stuff I'm going to achieve. I don't think there's any way God could have something bigger for me than what I want for myself. Oh, contraire. Let me tell you about a young man. He's a preacher now. Pastors a local church. You may be sitting in it this morning. And uh, when he graduated college, he had a plan. The plan was materialistic. I'm talking about myself. I had my degree. I had a job. Some of you have heard my testimony. I won't give it all to you. But I had a plan. And my plan included gathering everything I could, accumulating everything I could, achieving everything I could, I wanted houses, I wanted cars, I wanted land, I wanted everything that this world has to offer. That's what I wanted. That was my plan. I did not care what God wanted. I was saved. I loved the Lord. I just didn't want to mess in with my plan. Because, of course, I'm smarter than God. My plan is bigger and better than God's plan. But God allowed me, as I was climbing this corporate ladder, as I was accumulating stuff, living for the material things, He allowed something weird to happen. He allowed me to get miserable, empty. Things were not satisfying me. Cars, trips, Going and doing and having wasn't, wasn't working out the way I thought. So God humbled me. Somebody's humbled this morning. And that's a good place to be. Because when God humbles you, listen, he's getting ready to move. God, God, God can't do much with a, with a headstrong person with a person who's full of themselves, full of pride, and I was. You know, there's an old saying, you can't steer a parked car. That, that was me. I was sad. I was parked. I wasn't moving. I had my plan. I was going. But, but God, God had a different plan. He had a bigger plan. And I thought, how can it be bigger than me having everything I want? How can it be bigger? Well, like I say, he made me miserable, and I had to leave that job. 
that was helping me get my plan accomplished. And I humbled myself and, and I went to work for my dad, digging footings with a shovel and raking concrete. But God's up to something. He's got a plan for me that's bigger than the plan I have for myself. Again, I won't, I won't bore you with all the details, but today <laughs> I get to stand up in front of people I love every Sunday and I get to preach His Word. I get to pastor His church. I still get to pour concrete. That's a fringe benefit. It was, it was great. That, that's, that's my release. Okay, that's my therapy. That's, that's a message for another day. And let me tell you this, and, and, and David Tate and I were talking about this after the first service. What I'm doing right here, right now, in front of you, I'd rather do this than eat. And I love to eat. <laughs> I love to eat. But what I'm doing right now, I hope it shows, I'd rather do this than anything else. Hmm. My plan was good. For me. But God's plan was bigger and better. Amen. Amen? Did, did, did somebody just get what I'm saying here? Some of you have a plan. But if you will humble yourself. And let God work his plan in your life. It's worth it. It's worth it. Now I'm not saying he's going to make you a preacher or a missionary or anything. I don't know what he's going to do with you. But God has a plan. And, and listen, some of you, I, I know, you're, especially in, in, in the first service, forgive me, first service, watching on YouTube or, or Facebook, some of y'all are old. <laughs> Did he just tell us we're old? Yeah, some of y'all are old. And you're thinking, well, God's plan's gone for me. No, no, no. Ah, uh -uh. No. Listen, as long as you have breath in your body, God has a plan for you. Some of you are really young. And you're saying, my life's just beginning. Does God really have a plan for me? Yes, He does. Here's the thing, though. God is not going to tell you His plan in advance. That's just the way God works. You go, well, I don't like that. Tough. Because chances are, if God told you His plan for you in advance and spelled it out for you, you couldn't handle it anyway. Let me talk to you a minute. If He had told me back when, and Greg watched me go through this transition of sitting in a pew to standing up here. If, if, if God had told me while I was sitting in the pew and dealing with my heart, if He'd have said... Now, Brian, on this date, the church is going to call you here to fill in as preacher for a while. Then they're going to call you to pastor full time. And then you're going to end up being there over 20 years. I would have ran harder than I ran before. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why God just gives us His plan for us a little at a time. Because we couldn't handle it. It'd scare us to death. If God came up to Brian and said, Brian, here's what I've got planned for you. Here's what's going to happen. You know, your, your daughters are going to turn 22 years old. They're going to have double weddings. It's going to cost $200,000. <laughs> They're going to be missionaries around the world. You're gonna, all your hair's going to fall out and you're going to gain 80 pounds. <laughs> Brian doesn't want to know that. He does not want to know that. Lord, let me have a little bit of that at a time. <laughs> Amen? Now, I'm joking, but you understand what I'm saying. That's why God only gives it to us a little bit at a time. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. Because if we could see what was down the road, there'd be no need to have God, would there? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I can tell you all what. I can't wait. Because God loves me. God loves me. And God loves you. Don't underestimate His passion. Don't underestimate His plan for you. 
Listen. Let me say it again. God has bigger plans for you than you have for yourself. He's always trying to grow us. He's always trying to take us somewhere we've never been before. He does that in churches. I, Greg, look what he's done in this church in the last 10 years. Amazing. He does it in our personal lives. He, 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 he's doing something with us, in us, and for us that we never thought was possible. I never thought it was possible to pastor a church. That was out of the realm of possibility for me. And then when I started pastoring, and how many of y'all remember our, our old church, the, 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 old, the old building and all that? And, and we, you know, if, if we got 60 people in on a Sunday, that was a big Sunday. Now, we have a couple hundred in here every Sunday morning and hundreds, sometimes thousands, watching us on the Internet. That, 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 that is amazing. He's always trying to do more than we can imagine. Pastor, are you saying that God has a plan especially just for me? A absolutely. Listen, listen to this. God didn't create you and then take a chair in heaven, sit back just to see what you could do with your life. That's not the way he operates. He didn't, you're not a robot. He didn't create you, put a key in your back and wind you up and just say, okay, you go. You go do what you can do. See what you can accomplish. Okay? That's not the way God works. He's a with you every step of the way God. And He will be active and personal in your... He'll be intimate in your life. He'll guide you if... Everybody say if. If you'll humble yourself and let Him. You young people, I really hope you're hearing that. Because listen, when you get old... It's hard to change your ways. We're going to talk about that right now. <laughs> Let me give you a piece of scripture to hold on to. Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9. God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Amen. When we humble ourselves and give ourselves fully to God, Lord, not my plan, but your plan be done. I want to be obedient to you. He says, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way that you should go. He says, I will counsel you. It means he's going he's to stay with you. He's going to keep whispering in your spirit where you should go, the decisions you should make. And he says, and I will watch over you. Yes. I love that. To watch over someone means they are taking care of you, right? That's what God said. I'm going to watch over you. Don't be like the horse or the mule. Have we got any mule Christians in here today? Now, I could use the other word, but I won't. Because my wife got on to me about using words like that in church. What's the characteristic of a mule? Stubborn. Stubborn. I love you, Lord, but I want to do it my way. I, I, I love you, Lord, but my plan's better than your plan. God says, don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. God should not have to pull on us to get us to go to Him. We should run to our Father. So let God be God in your life. Yeah, you've probably got a plan. Some of our plans haven't worked out so well thus far. Amen? Some of them have worked out okay. You're doing all right. But God has something bigger and better for you. Don't be mule-headed. Let Him lead you. And stop underestimating the plans for you. Let me give you one more and we'll go home. We underestimate God's power. We underestimate God's power. 
Folks, no matter how overwhelming life gets, no matter how the enemy attacks, it doesn't matter how many devils and demons from hell Satan sends your way, God has more power. Amen? I was talking to a young man this past week, and it was an awesome conversation. This young man that I'm talking to, he worries. He worries about everything. Anybody know somebody like that? I know it's not you, but maybe you know somebody like that. That, that just worries. And he said, Brian, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they told me this story about this man who loved God. But Satan went to God and asked him if he could do something to this man to prove that he doesn't really love you. And God gave him permission to do that and said that, you know, he lost his family, he lost his fortune. But in the end, he got everything back and a whole bunch more. He said, you ever heard that story? I said, I have. I think his name was Job. He said, I don't know about that, but that's how the story went. <laughs> I said, what does that tell you? He said, it tells me that the devil can't touch me unless God allows it. And if God allows it, then God's going to take care of me. Revelation time. Amen? Church, let me tell you something. <laughs> Don't underestimate God's power. Even when you're being attacked, even when your life is being torn apart, God is still in control, and He is more powerful than any demon that you will ever encounter. In fact, God has the final say. Amen? And again, here's the problem. Some of us think we're big and bad. Some of y'all are big and bad. But you ain't devil big and bad. Amen? Okay? The devil, I'm just going to say it how we'd say it down here in the south, devil whoop your butt. I don't care how big and bad you are. If you, if you attack him... In your power, have my number on speed dial because you're going to need your preacher. Okay, because he's going to chew you up. He's going to spit you out, and you're going to be calling me going, Pastor, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's going on. Well, you, you're getting a, a butt kicking from hell is what you're getting. But the number that you need more than mine is you need your daddy's number. Because your daddy, I can't do much with the devil, but I know who can. Amen? Your, your father, who art in heaven, I like, I like to refer to God as my daddy. Again, he's personal with me. I like to be personal with him. He's my daddy who is in heaven. And he loves me. And he doesn't like it when his boy gets picked on. He doesn't like it when his girl gets picked on or any of his children get picked on. He don't like it. He is more powerful. Never underestimate the power. Listen to this, okay? If your faith is in Christ today, I love this, His power is in you. It's in you. How do you know that, preacher? Because in Acts 1, verse 8, Re re read it sometime. The Holy Sp Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come down and He's going to dwell in you. My power will be in God's power will be in you. Amen. Greater, let me say it again. Greater is He that is in you than He, this devil, that's in the world. Amen. My Bible also says something else, Greg. It says, I can do all things. Through Christ, who what? Strengthens me. What time is it? Well, I got time for one story. 
Let me, let me tell you one story, and then we'll go. This isn't in my notes. I didn't even tell this one to the first service. This is, this is, this is a bonus. <laughs> uh, and so some of you have heard it before, but I'm going to tell it again. So some of you haven't. Uh, I want to show you what, what your daddy does for you and how he'll make you feel. Okay? I went to, uh, I graduated from, from, from high school right, right down the road here. It was Edneyville High School. Do I have a witness? Amen. Yeah? Okay, a few of you. All right. Now, I'm going, I'm going way back. Okay, this is early 70s. Okay? And, and, uh, when you were in grades one through three, they didn't even have kindergarten when I started. Yes, I'm that old. They didn't even invented kindergarten yet. I don't know what happened. I started first grade in 1970. Okay? So for the first three years, you went down to Pace Road. Okay? Grades one, two, three. Now they eventually got grades one through five or six down there somewhere. Then they got a whole brand new school last year. It was cool. But after third grade, you came up to the big school. They had 4th grade through 12th grade together at Edneyville. Evelyn, you're, you, you was a grade behind me. You, you remember this. This was so cool. Now, now they, they kept us kind of separated, didn't they, Ronnie? They had this, us like grades 4, 5, and 6. There were some 7th graders down the lower building. And then the upper building was, was the, big, the big kids. Okay? But when you got to school in the morning, and if you got there early like I did... And my brother did because our parents worked. And they had to be at work early. So we would get to school early. They'd drop, Mom would drop us off early. I, I'm talking like a little after 7 o'clock. Okay? And so we would go and play basketball beside the old school. Okay? I can still see it in my mind. I know exactly. But we were out there playing. And, and when I was little, loved playing basketball. That, that was my thing. And I had just a little bit of skill. Not, not, not much. Just a little bit of skill. But I could dribble basketball and I, and I could run around and all that. And uh, I was in fourth or fifth grade, and we're playing with the high schoolers. Okay? And uh, so we're, we're, we're playing there, and I'm going around, and I pass the ball, and, and our side was winning. This is before school, early. And our side was winning. And you know how boys are, especially high school boys. Yeah, look at us. We're kicking your eye, you know, going, going on all that. Well, I had the ball another time. It, we, we had it, and I was going through there. And, and this big boy, one of the high schoolers, elbowed me and knocked me down on the ground. I mean, Greg lay, laid me out. I was laying there just, oh, about to, you know, I'm fourth, fifth grade. I'm about to cry. <laughs> but, you know, you don't want to cry in front of the big boys. So I was trying to hold it together. All of a sudden, this big high schooler was laying beside me. <laughs> the one that had hit me was laying beside me. I looked up. My cousin, who was older, his name was Jay, he took it upon himself to avenge me <laughs> with an uppercut to his jaw. Laid him down. I stood up and went, yeah, yeah. I went from about to cry to going, oh. Little chest puffed out. Look at me. Yeah. I got somebody to protect me. Okay? I know that's all funny, beloved, but that's life. The devil's going to come around and he's going to knock you down. He's going to try to hurt you, but you got somebody on your side. Never underestimate his passion, his love for you. He's, he, he's with you. He's got power. And he's going to protect you. Yeah, you may get knocked down sometimes, but he's always going to lift you up and you're going to go, yeah, I got this. As long as I'm with him, I'm all right. Amen. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Amen. Band, come, come, come on up. Come on up. If you will, stand to your feet. Never underestimate. God's passion, God's plan, God's power. Somebody here today in this room right now, you're facing something that's too big for you. 
You are. You're facing something that's too much for you to handle. So, somebody needs to call their daddy. Not their earthly one, but their heavenly one. Somebody needs to come down this aisle and, and lay their burden down. Say, Father, Daddy, I can't handle this. I can't, I can't do this anymore. Would you do it for me? I never want to underestimate your passion or your power. Would you help me? Somebody else needs to come down and they need to rededicate their lives because your fires went out. God has his passion, but your passion has waned a little bit. There may be somebody here that needs to give their heart to Jesus for the first time. If that's you, I invite you down. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for letting me do what I do. Thank you for the plan that you have for my life. You were so good to me. Thank you. Thank you. During this time of invitation and reflection, Father, would you just have your will in your way? Speak to every heart in here, Lord Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.